Hello, welcome to Fellowship Bible Church Online. I'm so glad that you've joined with us to study God's Word. It's a real privilege of ours to serve you. And, and we would just ask, if we haven't heard from you before, would you reach out to us? We'd love to start a conversation and get to know you better. As we begin looking at God's Word, I think a good place to start is straight from the Bible. And so if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Galatians chapter 2, and we're just going to read a few verses. Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 14. This is the Word of God. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when he came they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Let's thank God for this word. Heavenly Father, your word is alive and it's powerful. And we know that in it we find everything we need to live a life that's ordered towards you, a life that's rich in your gospel. Father, a life that's better. I pray that you would help us understand these words and apply them to our lives as we work our way through this passage. We just love you so much and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, I love this book, this Galatians. It's just so rich and thoughtful. It's a book all about the gospel, and we're really getting into a great part of it as we move towards some of the application of the gospel and how it works in our own lives. And so um, we talk a lot about the gospel in this passage. And since we do, I think it's important to define it. What do we mean when we say gospel? The gospel simply is the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And he's done everything necessary for us to be part of his kingdom and his family, to be free from sin and death and hell, and to um, have hope for an amazing future with him. He's done it all. Man, and that's amazing that he's done it all. I hope you know it for yourself. But I heard a statement once that is so true. Doctrinal faithfulness the faithfulness to this truth, the gospel, alone, by itself, is not faithfulness. Doctrinal faithfulness is not faithfulness. We can totally believe in God and believe in His grace and still betray it. We can still live detached from it, disconnected. Every week that we've been in Galatians, we've come back to the same phrase, that to add to the gospel is to lose the gospel. And the same is true in our passage, except for we see that we can add to the gospel through our actions and not just what we believe or think. We, we add to it by what we do. Paul's concern in the verses just before this one is that the truth of the gospel would be preserved in God's people. And here we see that we can, um, what that looks like in verse 14, that we would not fall out of step with the gospel. Step is a, is a word of movement, an action. It's something that we, that we do. And that's really what we're going to see today from this passage. How do we stay in step with the gospel? How can we live consistent lives to the gospel? And it isn't just what we think, right? It's what we do. It's how we act. Let's look at verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, it's Peter. When Peter came to Antioch, Antioch was um, Paul's home church. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. As we look at this passage the confrontation just stands out, right? We have Peter and Paul, these two pillars of the church, these huge figures in the church. And what is seen as Paul stands up to Peter in front of his whole church. Can you imagine it? The, the awkwardness, the intensity that's there. As he calls out Peter. One of my favorite novels is called The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. And there's this one scene in that book where these two armies are battling each other and they're going at it and going at it. And as they fight in this big, massive conflict, there's two storms that come overhead and crash together. And it just blows everything apart, right? It's a mayhem, debris and all kinds of stuff just fly everywhere. The intensity of, that con of the conflict in that scene is gripping. And it's kind of the feeling I get here as we see 
Peter and Paul collide. That's how intense it seems to me. Why does Paul stand up and confront Peter in front of a whole bunch of people? Why does he do this? He sees the gospel at stake in Peter's actions. And to him, the gospel is the most important thing that we can hold on to. It's the most important. And, and it's worth fighting for. And so he does. He fights for it. And already we have an implication that stands out. The gospel is something worth fighting for. It's a place to take a stand and be courageous to battle for it for the truth of the gospel, and draw a line in the sand and say, here's a spot that we're not going to budge on. We're not going to back down from. It's here on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when it comes to this, even be willing to go to a brother and sister and confront them and say, man, you're drifting from the gospel. It might be awkward for us. It might be difficult, but it is at times necessary. We've got to see it. In this passage, we can't get away from the confrontation that takes place. It has to happen. It was important. And it has to, uh, if we want to stay in line with the gospel, there has to be times like this. Because we're flawed people. But we do need to think deeply about what's going on here. Like, I've experienced a situation like this, and it was not helpful for me in the time that I experienced it. Is this situation the way that we should confront others? Is this how Paul stands up before Cephas? Is this how we should act and step up for the sake of the gospel? As I think about this, Jesus' words um, from Matthew 18, 15 stand out in my mind. If anyone has an offense against his brother, go to him privately first. Go to him privately. Is Paul wrong in how he treats Cephas or Peter? The problem is, like, we don't really have any backstory. This is just a couple of lines of an event that Paul is telling. My assumption is that he probably followed what Jesus commanded, but I have no way to prove that. And perhaps the circumstances simply didn't allow for it. Maybe this is all that happened. Either way, Paul and Peter are not the same as us. They're in a unique position. They're apostles. They're leaders of whole groups of people. Their choices affected so many. They didn't have the New Testament written to guide. There were a lot of people hurt by what Peter did. They were made to feel like outsiders, like second-class Christians. And so you take all these things together, the very public sin of Peter, the amount of people he hurt by what he did, his position in the church, and how it required public correction and consequences. It did require public correction and consequences. Sometimes this might be the necessary course of action. You see it in the Old Testament as Nathan confronts David. David steals a wife from a man and has that guy murdered. And Nathan goes to him as he's holding court and he confronts him with his sin. And it's important that he did that. For the sake of the whole nation, it was important that he did that. But it seems to me that moments like that are unusual. Not many of us have the sphere of influence of a king or of an apostle or the public role. And so I don't think that this pattern is for everyone and in every situation. It's not the norm. It's a specific set of circumstances. But I do think that the implication behind it is right. Through Paul's example, we're reminded of the important truth that when the gospel is at stake in the lives of our brothers and our sisters, we must be willing to step up and to fight for the truth of the gospel within them. The way Paul did it in this passage is unique and uncommon. So then how do we do it? A little bit later in the book of Galatians, Galatians 6, 1, we read a, a verse that, that I think sets a pattern for us. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Man, it takes wisdom and courage to confront someone. It takes far more wisdom and far more courage to confront someone and restore them in a spirit of gentleness. We intuitively know that the easiest way to confront is just by lashing out, right? Right? It's the easiest way, by being the storm, that snarky comment that, that's behind someone's back or, or even just loud enough so they can hear it, right? The overreaction, the, the times that we let it go, let it go, let it go, and then explode, 
the statement when we don't like a post on Facebook. But when we meet face to face, and out of love, talking to the person, and saying, not that, you know, argue, or confronting them, not saying that I want to be right here, but man, I want to restore you. I want you back in the gospel. It takes far more courage. It is far harder to say, I love you, but there's something wrong. You need to come back. Even though this is hard, we need it. We need it. We need to be there. We must be bold enough to be willing to go there for our brothers and sisters who need gracious correction in the gospel. Those ones who've fallen out of step with the gospel. And so we fight for the gospel in each other, not as a boxer or like an MMA fighter just ready to go, but with resolute gentleness, like Jesus who's confronting Peter and Thomas and the woman at the well. He knows they're full of failure. He knows their weakness, but he moves to them and in a spirit of gentleness restores them. So we don't just step up. We need to step towards the one who's not consistent in the gospel and point them back to it. And at the same time, we need others to come to us and step into our lives and the moments when we've fallen out of step and speak to us. And they see, hey man, you've, you've gone out of line. You've left, you've drifted. We need them to fight for us because we're not flawless. God has given us each other for a reason. And I think a big part of it is to be there to help each other in the most difficult situations, even going as far to confront. We need this for others. We need this from others. In verse 11, we see that to stay in step with the gospel, we need to fight for its presence in each other. We need it and we need to help others come back in faith and repentance and receive the grace that God has already purchased for them and for us. To stay in step with the gospel, we need to fight for it. We need to fight for its presence in each other. To do that, it takes courage, right? It's hard. What if I'm wrong? What if I'm rejected? What if I'm ridiculed? There's a lot of reasons that we could come up with to um, make us back down from our responsibility to each other. But I think that it often comes back to this one thing, fear. Fear of people. In verse 12, we get a bit more of the story. Peter stands condemned, verse 11, verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and he separated himself fearing the circumcision party. Initially, Peter was eating and spending time with the Gentiles and these other people come in and out of fear, he changes the way he acts. He gives in to them and makes others feel like the outsider. We're going to talk about the real issue going on in this passage, uh, in this scene, in just a moment. But for right now, I just want to think about this. When fear of man overshadows fear of God, we fall out of step of the gospel. When fear of man overshadows our fear of God, we fall out of step of the gospel. We don't act for God. We don't act for the good of his people. We, when we fear man, we act for the good of ourselves. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is saved. Because Peter feared man, he got trapped in a snare of his own making. And he did the opposite of what he should have done. He did the opposite of Paul. He didn't have the courage to stand up to his brothers and in gentleness restore them, but instead found it easier to give in to their hypocrisy. And I bet he had all kinds of reasons and all kinds of rationale why he would do that. Why it was okay for him to act this way, we always do. We always have reasons. This gets difficult. It gets harder because when we read this, we want to read ourselves in Paul's shoes and, and be the one who's brave and willing to go to our brother and confront them. But he's the odd one out in this passage. He's alone as he stands up. Even Barnabas is carried away. Paul's unique, and we're far more often like Peter and the others, giving into the fear of man. 
I know that I can think of times when, when I've seen something going on in a friend's life and I thought, man, I should probably say something to them and, and I, should, I should try to bring them back and later totally regretted not doing it. A specific situation, I was in my 20s and this younger guy asked me for help and I was busy and I didn't, I didn't walk through his struggles with him like I should have. And I still think about it from time to time. There's this moment when I could have been there We've all had moments like that. Or maybe we've had moments of peer pressure, fear of others, doing something that we know is wrong or agreed that we, uh, to do something that we know we shouldn't have done. Back in high school, hanging out with that in crowd and ridiculing the person on the outside. Relentlessly, ruthlessly teasing them. In Peter, we have a reminder of the decisions that fear of men causes us to make and we have an opportunity to reorient ourselves to the gospel. Because in Paul, we see the courage that the gospel can bring. As he stands alone, and he stands up. I'm sure he was aware of how bad his confrontation could go, but Paul understood that the gospel casts out fear. Remember the verse we read from Proverbs, that the fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. There's certainty there. There's a strength there, a strength and courage that comes from God. You can think of a little kid at the top of a slide and, and she's just petrified. She won't go down. She won't move until she sees her mom or dad down there with their arms stretched out. I'll catch you. Come on. And so because she has that safety, she trusts in them and she knows that whatever happens, her parents are going to catch her. She's brave enough to go down. For us, God's there with his arms open wide and he's saying, I've got you. Don't fear man. He says, I'm greater than them. And I've, I've got you. For us and the people around us, we've got to be courage. We've got to have courage. We've got to be courageous. We've got to be acting in the safety and strength of God. And we do, must not give in to the fear of man, but must have the courage to do the right thing, even if it means graciously confronting our brothers and sisters. Verse 12, for us to stay in step with the gospel, we need courage. For us to stay in step with the gospel, we cannot give in to the fear of man. We need the courage. And God's giving it to us. But what if we don't have it? What if we don't take advantage of the safety we have in God? And what if we don't go in, and be courageous? What if we give in to fear? We see it in the next couple of verses, verses 13 and 14. The rest of the Jews acted hip hypocritically along with him, so even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul calls what they've done hypocrisy. Verse 13, he says it twice. In verse 14, he describes it. He said, you, you live this way, but you're forcing all these other people to live the other way. If we were just to read this quickly and we didn't have Paul's statement, we might assume that what's going on here is just simple favoritism, right? His buddies come up from this other church, and so he wants to go hang out with them and eat with them. He's playing favorites. What's the big deal? But to understand this, we really have to think about the dynamics of the early church. This isn't just about eating a meal. It's about law and culture. The Jewish food laws prevented Jews from eating with the unclean people, the Gentiles. And it was like that to set the Jews apart and give them this holy identity. You could see that they were God's people. For a Jew to eat with a Gentile then, he would have been considered unclean. He would have done something wrong. He would have had to... Repent for that. But when Jesus came, he did everything necessary for us to be part of God's family, to be considered one of God's people. And in the gospel, we don't have the same restrictions because it's all been done. <laughs> it's been done. In fact, in Acts chapter 9, we read about how God tells Peter this. Peter knows he understands the truth. God tells him that all the foods are now clean in this vision um, that he has. And then Peter goes on later to tell a Gentile, Cornelius, that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him 
and does what is right is acceptable to him. So Peter knows the truth. He knows that these Jewish Christians are not living in step with the gospel and that they're mistaking their cultural identity as Jews as something necessary for people to be right with God. Peter's action sent the message to the Gentiles that they were still unclean. And this is at the heart of the issue, right? Peter's actions told certain people that they weren't really in the group. They weren't insiders. The gospel wasn't enough to bring them into this community that God promised them. What Jesus did wasn't enough to make them clean. Peter's action wasn't a preference. It was a statement. As he makes this statement through his actions, Peter steps away from the gospel because to change the gospel is to lose the gospel. But listen to this. The gospel responds. It says, you could jump down and read 16 through 21 sometime, and, and the gospel responds and says that our standing before God is based solely on faith and His grace and not our following the law. In other words, the gospel tells us that even though we might be at different places in our growth, the blood of Jesus makes us all equal members of his people. No matter our background, no matter our political affiliation, no matter our culture, it doesn't even matter our position on vaccinations for or against. Everyone who's in Christ is part of his body and has the same value. The end of the next chapter. Galatians 3.28, it's so clear. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. There's neither male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse is about unity. We're all one. We've all entered into Christ and into his church and into this community the same way. And so we are not more valuable than anyone else. We are not more worthy than anyone else. We are not more clean than anyone else. But Peter's hypocrisy was saying that we are not equal. Last week, I had a conversation with some really good friends, and we talked about how, um, as humans, we have the tendency to isolate and to push uh, down certain groups of people. Even with discussions going on right now about racism and equality, our society has found people to push to the outside. But man, the gospel is different. The gospel is unique. It shows us a better way. Jesus says in John 6 that anyone who comes to me, it doesn't matter what, what their past has been. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter their political views. Anyone who comes to me, I will not cast out. When we give into fear and our natural tendency to despise these outliers, we become hypocrites. And we don't act on what we say we believe. Salvation is either by the work of Christ or it's not. Didn't Jesus invite us? Didn't Jesus invite us when we were outsiders? When we were rebels? When we were unclean? Didn't he take us and bring us into his own family? If you are listening to this, we want you to know Jesus. If you don't know him, we want you to know him, to have him as your own. We live in a world where people are out for themselves, right? We, we live in a world where the outliers are pushed to the outsides. We live in a world where people are dominated by fear. But Jesus says, I'm not like that. Come to me and I will not cast you out. You've done stuff wrong. You've got a past. I know, he says. I know I gave my life so that you could be forgiven from that, so you could be redeemed from that and restored in gentleness from that. That's the grace he has for you. If you have that grace already, let us fight the tendency to move back away from it, to fall into hypocrisy. Fellowship Bible Church May it never be said that we did not love a person that Christ bought with his own blood, either, either through our words or our actions or even our thoughts. May it never be said that we require something of a person that Jesus did not also require from them. Friends, let's defy 
hypocrisy in our church and in our own lives. That's what we see in verses 13 through 14, that to stay in step with the gospel, we must defy hypocrisy. We must abolish hypocrisy. We can't have a theology that says one thing and a life that says another. Number one, to stay in step with the gospel, we need to fight for its presence in each other. Number two, to stay in step with the gospel, we need to be courageous for each other. Number three, to stay in step with the gospel, we must fight hypocrisy within us and each other. All of this comes down to the way that we live out the gospel in our own lives and with each other. Peter knew the truth. This is the troubling part in this, in this passage. Like Peter knew the truth, but it didn't transfer into the way he acted. And so we read, he stands condemned. He's, he's drifted from the gospel. Peter's problem wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a preference. It wasn't even a false doctrine. Peter's problem is that his knowledge of grace didn't produce a culture of grace. His knowledge of the gospel didn't produce a culture of the gospel. And for the people in the church of Antioch and for the people in this church, for us to have any hope of staying in line with the gospel, we need a gospel culture. We cannot be people marked by fear and hypocrisy. We must be people, be people who love each other enough and are courageous enough to speak into each other's lives, to be a church so focused on the gospel that we will be willing to accept and give gracious correction because we know the value in it. We welcome it. We need this gospel culture. And the beauty is we have everything that we need to have it. We already have it. We already have everything we need. Within us, we've tasted and experienced the grace of the gospel. And around us, we have people who've also tasted the same thing. We have everything we need. God's given it to us. What we learn in this passage is that staying in step with the gospel doesn't only mean knowing the gospel. It means living the gospel out in our church, in our daily lives. We need that culture of gospel. Grace overflows to those who've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and where we don't exclude, but we encourage growth and transformation into the image of Jesus. Maybe we could say it like this. To have the gospel... We have to live the gospel. And thanks be to God who has saved us, that he works in us still, helping us defeat sin, helping us to be more like him, helping us to choose righteousness and choose grace and choose love. We need a gospel culture, and by His grace, we will succeed. So let's live this grace out that we've got. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this passage. Lord, and even though it's unsettling that a person such as Peter could, could turn his back through his actions, Father, I thank you that your grace is sufficient to bring one such as him back. If Peter falls, we can also fall. But if you've restored him, we can also be restored. And that is such a hopeful truth. Father, I pray that you'd help us have a culture of grace and a culture of the gospel in our church and amongst us. Lord, we trust that you will. Apply these truths to our hearts in a specific way. Help us to see the, the areas that we are not following and we are not in step with your gospel. We trust that you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.